All right, welcome to lecture 13, and this will be broken up into about five little mini lectures, each covering a particular subject. And so today we're going to go over some of the basics of neural tissue and the functional cell of the nervous system, the neuron. But I want to touch up on some of the difficulties that people have in understanding the nervous system. So most of the systems and organs within that system have very easily understandable function. Your skeleton provides a framework along with your muscles, allowing movement of the body. Your digestive system digests food. Your lungs exchange gases. Your heart pumps blood. Your vascular system transports that blood. If 10 experts wrote books or chapters on any of those organs, they would all look pretty similar. Function would be similar. The terminology would be similar. The classification would be similar. At this point in history, we have a pretty good idea of how things work for most of our systems and organs. I'm going to go ahead and say the brain and the nervous system are a little different. I have four or five books on my shelf at home about the brain. If you were to pick up any two of those books and read both, you'd really start to wonder what those two books have in common. Right, well, so what I'm trying to get out here is that the brain and nervous system function is actually very complex and multifaceted. So even with modern neural imaging techniques where we can correlate specific patterns of neural activities with certain behavior, it's still hard to understand how that relates to our subjective experience. And these are the kind of questions about the brain and mind that philosophers and stoned adolescents struggle with. But we'll be taking a less lofty view and look at the brain with a more grounded perspective. Even keeping it as simple as possible, it can be difficult to discuss any one subject without first jumping ahead and using other terms that you haven't learned yet. So as you move along in these lectures, lectures, I encourage you to pause the video at any point when you encounter a term that we've not gone over yet. Make a note of those terms, keep a list, check your text, or ask me later what that term means, because it's going to be easy to fall behind quick as we go over this material. So let's start with the idea that your mind is a product of the brain, which is a soft, gelatinous organ, and like any biological entity, it is composed of cells. So human brain cells do not have any magical properties. In fact, most of what we know about neurons come from other animals, such as this rat brain slice that we see right here. Images such as these back at the turn of the 20th century by the uh, neuroanatomy superhero, Spanish neuroscientist Ramon Cajal, proved the brain adhered to the cell theory and was not some magical protoplasmic spirit fluid. It is indeed a piece of meat, although it is the most complex and amazing piece of meat in the universe. At least that's what my brain tells me. But again, I like to ground the concept of the nervous system by looking at more simple examples of what is ultimately nervous system function. And what nervous system function is really ultimately about is movement. That is coordinated movement in a controlled fashion in multicellular animals. But movement in response to stimuli is a very basic biological function. Individual cells can detect stimuli by various receptors and move in response to that stimuli. Once you get to the level of multicellular animals, you'll see that cells become specialized to perform specific functions. Some cells will become specialized to detect environmental stimuli and pass that information on to other cells that may become specialized for movement. As animals become more complex and cells become further specialized, this allows networks of cells to form and allow more and more complicated movement. So these kind of cells that receive and pass on information are doing exactly what the functional cells of the nervous system do. And those functional cells are one of the two main cell types that make up neural tissue. Those functional cells are called neurons or neural cells. And then the other type of cells are the glial cells that support those neurons in various ways. So those are the two basic types. And within those two basic types, there's subtypes. There's three types of neurons based on their function and six types of glial cells based on their location and function. We'll cover them later. The neuron anatomy, that is the parts of these complex cells and their functional regions will be core to everything we're learning here about the nervous system. 
so we'll talk about them first. The cell body, often referred to as the soma, like any other cell, houses the typical organelles and some structures reflecting the highly active nature of neurons as well as their complex shape. A so-called typical neuron, such as the one shown here, has numerous extensions or processes that branch from the cell body like the limbs on the tree. Those processes are called dendrites. These dendrites are specialized to receive signals or information by environmental stimuli or from other neurons. On the right, you see a close-up of one of those dendrites from this three-dimensional reconstruction of a neuron. Note the dendritic spines. Each one is a specialized structure that receives information from another neuron. So any given neuron can be receiving signals from thousands of other neurons. So any given neuron will have many other neurons trying to influence whether it passes on that signal to another neuron or neurons, or maybe to some muscle fibers. All those signals from all over the neurons and dendrite in the cell body are directed toward a particular area where the whole activity is summed and the decision to fire or not is made. That could be thought of as the trigger zone and it's called the axon hillock. It's a singular location that leads to the axon. While there are numerous dendrites extending from the cell body, there's only a single axon on the neuron. So dendrites and the soma are receiving and actually processing signals and information. The axon is only passing on that information. It's a conducting process of the neuron passing on a signal to the next target. So when you hear the term nerve fiber, it is referring to the axon. When you learn about nerves, you'll understand that they are bundles of axons. Within the spinal cord and brain, you'll learn about tracts and columns and white matter. All these are collections of axons transferring impulses. So these are basically cables transporting impulses from one place to another. Although there's only a single axon, the axon may branch off to connect to several targets or multiple locations on the same targets as shown here. And those branches are called the telodendria and the axon ends and those structures called the axon terminals are terminal boutons. At the axon terminal, or bouton, the message passed on through a chemical signal to another neuron or to what is referred to as an effector, which could be a muscle or a gland. And one last thing about axons for now. Axons can extend from the cell body of a neuron a great distance to innervate the target. For instance, a neuron whose cell bodies in the brain may extend its axon down the spinal cord all the way down to the lumbar region, and then a neuron in the lumbar region of the spinal cord may extend its axon all the way down to the foot. So those are the different anatomical regions of a neuron and their functions. And when we get to the basic divisions of the nervous system, that is the central and the peripheral nervous system, we'll see that an axon may have its dendrites and cell body within the central nervous system, and its axon extending out into the peripheral nervous system, or vice versa. Also, later on when we discuss gray and white matter of the central nervous system, the gray matter is going to contain the cell bodies and the dendrites, whereas the white matter is going to consist of axons, that is axons that are myelinated, another term we'll talk about later.